control of man, time and the environment. It's really inspired by the fact that man is still producing an extra billion people every 10 years on this planet. How did this happen, this sculpture? Uh, I was approached in about 1987-88 by the council after I'd finished my big sculpture in Ringham Mall and they said, look, you know, we love what you've done there, it's time we had a sculpture. And I said, well, where do you want it and what do you want it for or where are you going to put it? And they said, well, you know, we'll put it in a park somewhere. And, and they said, well, maybe the scene could be, um, uh, we'll have a garden clock, something like a clock uh, involved in it or some sort of clock, you know just as a symbolical thing. And I said, okay, well, then my suggestion is that you think about what a sculpture means. When you go to France, you go to a little village, or in many places in the continent, and the square has a bistro where you sit down and have a pastis and argue with the ladies and watch the old men like me play uh, boule. And everyone knows where the center of town is because that is the heart. And in the middle of that little square, there is a sculpture. And, you know, it's the soul of the place. And Hornsby, I said, and look, everyone drives through this place and nobody knows it's here. The people don't have a heart and soul, a centre. So go away and think about where you're going to have it, because it has to, the sculpture has to be powerful enough to create the environment where it's located, like restaurants, and changes the architecture. So ultimately, over years, the sculpture, if it's properly constructed, stays there forever, and the world changes around it and becomes influenced by it. So they went away and came back two years later and said, right, we want you to put a scarf and we're going to close these two streets and we want you to put us on the map and so on. I said, great, you know, fantastic. And off we went and I designed it a sculpture that would put them on the map <laughs> and you know, the kids and everyone had a great influence on what I thought would be popular so I've created a sculpture which has something for everybody um, in terms of its popularity I'm absolutely delighted I feel so um, humbled uh, by the response I've had over the years and the fact that Hornsby has taken it to its heart in, in terms of critics, it took about two, three years of shock before anyone commented. And then uh, Michael Hedges, this famous Australian critic, came out with his book on public sculpture in Australia and made comments like the council has shown huge courage in installing it and it's uh, quite inspirational and this and that. So it became accepted and I breathe a sigh of relief. Um, so what have we got on the sculpture? Uh, it took me two and a half years to design it and build it um, and uh, it was commissioned in 1993, 15 years ago. Uh, the clock itself, as I said to you earlier on, is actually larger than Big Ben. It has the same time cycle, but twice the counterweight and um, uh, it was the second largest pendulum clock of any sort in the world, let alone a, a water clock. That's now, I think, the third largest. And Professor Philip Fischel of uh, Sydney University wrote an article in the British Biological Society magazine saying it was completely unique in the mechanism that there be no clock thought like it. Now, I didn't set out to do that. I didn't actually set out originally to do a clock at all. But my uh, background, uh, besides art, is engineering design, uh, mining equipment. So I thought, well, why not make the damn thing work? And I studied all the water clocks around the world. And, and um, the, in terms of the clock itself, the only mistake I made, I think, was that um, I thought that the, the guy who did, did design the original water clock, which is not like this one, was a Swiss. And if you read the plates around here, you'd think that the guy's a Swiss. He's not a Frenchman, so I told the truth. <laughs> now, um, in terms of the water wheel, I found the design of a water wheel, um, it's an 11th century Chinese water wheel. And it was made of wood, and it used to draw, uh, drive a, a, uh, an observatory. The observatory had to be kept pointed at the sun, so they installed this water wheel clock to keep the thing pointed at the sun. So rather than build it out of wood, which is an impossible material in terms of maintenance, I built it out of stainless steel and brass and, and glass and various things. But it weighs over a ton, uh, so it's an interesting device. The clip side is, um, I was chipping tubes on the other side. I had the first clock ever invented by man 
the Egyptians had just a filling pot and they filled it up at a fairly set rate and they measured the water and that gave them the time of day. The Greeks developed that by feeding a vertical tube from a meniscus filled tank so the water flow is absolutely steady and by measuring the water each day and tipping it out at the end of the day they could tell what the time is. So it was a duplicate of the original idea that rather than just have it sitting there full of water I put it on bearings and danced it delicately so it tips its own water out. It needs a slight amount of adjustment at the moment, there's too much water that's escaping out of the hole so it doesn't stop and it doesn't spin right round but usually it does and, and they can fix that with a bit of chewing gum so there's no problem there. The Korean, I think I've told you about, was uh, the original concept and I took uh, notes and sketches of the hammers and various bits. Certainly the Harrington that has come into Korean were not as elegant in the shape of the suspension mechanism but the hammers are duplicates of those original machines. They went broke um, shortly after the Second World War, so there are no more of them built. That one is the largest in the world that has 17 notes compared to most of them that have 6 to 8 notes. There are about 3 of them in Australia. One of them I think is in the top of the church in Lindsay and so on. Um, the, the, um, the, the sculpture itself, the environmental concept, you people are amongst the most fortunate in the world. You're sitting beside, in my opinion, the most magnificent national park that could ever be created. It's an extraordinary place with rainforest and, and waterfalls and pools. Karingai National Park, the place there is fantastic. The Angotra trees, I spend hours sketching them and converting their shapes into different things. They're just wonderful and the environment is fantastic. On this sculpture there's about 50 different species of birds and animals all sculpted in realistic form which are a tribute to the environment and a tribute to horn trees and wonderful national park. Um, on it, by the way, is a half-sized sculpture of a mother and child. And my object in doing that is to be surrounded by full-sized animals, which makes it look rather threatening because it makes the human species slightly threatened, and we are certainly threatening ourselves. So it was quite intentional to put the human figures in sitting down uh, with the large-sized animals around saying, hey, if you don't pay attention to us, we're all in the same boat. Um, it's interesting that I was looking forward to spending about a year or two in jail of recent times with Bill Henson, because whilst all the new high was on about whether Bill's art was art or child abuse, um, I remind people in Hornsby here that you have a naked little boy, complete in all manner, on that sculpture that's been here since 1993, and nobody has complained. So unfortunately, the government uh, uh, authorities decided that Henson's work, which is quite extraordinarily beautiful, was art and nothing happened. So I'm free of going to jail with him for a while. Um, the only other thing I can say is that I have to take my hat off to Hornsby Council. Uh, the, uh, they had the courage to order this and build it. Uh, it's now acknowledged by people as being one of the remarkable uh, sculptures of Australia and the uh, Hornsby Council has been told in writing and publishing in books that they have huge courage in going ahead and it's worthwhile. And that's all the time.